Little Britches. Father and I were ranchers. Chapter 5. The Big Wind. I think it was my lying about the ties that got us the buckboard. One night, I came in from tie hauling to hear father and mother talking together in the kitchen. Mother was saying, but Charlie, we can't just load the children into the old farm wagon like cordwood and haul them off to church. We saved quite a little from what we expected to pay for the new horse and harness. Somewhere, we should be able to find something better in the way of a conveyance that's within our means. Mr. Cash came by on Saturday, and he had our buckboard tied behind his wagon. Sunday, we all went to church at Fort Logan. Church and Sunday school were held in the day school room. There weren't enough seats to have them both at one time, so the grown folks stayed outside and talked while we had Sunday school, and we played outside while they had church. The fathers of most of the other children who went to Sunday school were soldiers at the fort. Some of the kids were kind of tough. I learned a couple of new words from them, and Philip learned a lot. He called Muriel a couple of them after we got home, and mother cried so hard that father sent us all into the bedroom. We could only hear a word or two she was saying between sobs. It was something about not being able to stand what the ranch was doing to her boys. From then on, mother held Sunday services at home. Father had been hauling long poles to be cut into fence posts for about a week when the big wind came. It was blowing when we woke up and the tumbleweeds were rolling across the prairie like big brown bowling balls pitched by some giant in the mountains. By school time, it was too strong for Grace and me to stand against it. By noon, it had racked our house until some of the windows had broken out and the doors were jammed fast in their casing. The whole house was vibrating like a beaten drum and every few minutes, a joint among the rafters would crack with a report as sharp as a rifle shot. Father's face was gray and mother's milk white. Neither of them spoke. Their mouths were clamped tight, and the muscles popped out and in on the sides of father's jaws. I could see Muriel, Philip, and Hal crying, but against the roar of the wind, I couldn't hear them. Father went out and untied the horses. They drifted away to the east, the wind whipping their tails up under their bellies. Next, he brought poles and propped them against the lee side of the house. Mother huddled us into a corner of the bedroom away from the windows. She crouched over us like a hen brooding her chicks. There came a tearing screech from the roof as the wind ripped away a section of shingles and sheets of plaster fell from the ceiling. Father crawled in through the blown out window with a coil of rope in his hand. He took his Sunday suit from the corner and told mother to put it on. Then he knotted the rope around our chests and shoulders until all but Hal were strung on it, the way Mother used to string popcorn balls for Christmas, about five feet apart. Philip was on one end and Muriel on the other. Mother had taken off her dress and put on Father's suit with the sleeves and legs rolled way up. Father tied Philip's end of the rope around her waist and Muriel's end around his own. Then he motioned Mother to follow, tied Hal on to his back like a papoose, and crawled out the window. As she passed us out to him, he had us fall to the ground and lie still. After he lifted mother down, he crouched and told us to crawl on our stomachs like horned toads, that dust would get in our eyes, but we must keep them open so as not to crawl into cactus beds. Our nearest neighbors were the Altlands a mile upwind. Fort Logan was to the east, three and a half miles away. With no houses in between, father crawled east, and we crawled after him. When we had wiggled along for a hundred yards or so, father stopped to let us rest, and I looked back toward Philip and mother. Philip must have gotten cactus spines in his hand because he held it out toward mother and tried to sit up. The wind caught him and rolled him like a tumbleweed as far as the rope would let him go. As he went, mother sprang to her hands and knees. She was no more than up before she sprawled forward on her face as though some giant had put his foot on her from behind and shoved. 
In that same backward glance, I saw the roof of our new barn fly away like a sheet of newspaper. We started on. The next time we stopped to rest, I looked back again. There was blood on Mother's face. Our barn was gone completely. A few minutes after, we'd begun crawling again. Something like the shadow of a great bird flashed past me on the ground. I raised my head, and a second later, the body of our farm wagon struck a few feet beyond Father. It bounced crazily like a football and flew away in kindling wood. My eyes were running from the dirt in them. My nose burned as though the dust in it were pepper, and I was coughing from breathing through my mouth. At the next rest, I lifted my head again and looked up and down the line. Father was coughing hard. I could see Hal bounce up and down on his back. Philip was sobbing and gasping for breath against the pull of the wind. And Mother's face was black where dirt had mixed with blood. I had no idea where Father was taking us, but after a dozen or more steps, I knew we were going more north than east. We were not going to Fort Logan. We crawled across the wagon road and on and on. The wind ripped up curled dried leaves of buffalo grass and raked them across our faces like jigsaw blades. At last, Father stopped and waved his lifted arm. Then he raised them both and made motions like a man pulling himself up a rope. We all understood and drew ourselves up to him. There was fresh blood at the corners of his mouth. We got our heads close to his and he yelled, we're almost there. We're going to be all right. And we'll pause here and finish this chapter in the next video. Till then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thanks so much for listening. Love you guys. Bye-bye.